it is, of course, an honour to be invited to give this lecture uh, named after such um, a, a, well, a famous and well-recognised engineer. Um, I don't know much about holography, um, but it's, uh, it's a privilege to give this lecture. I want to talk about building brains, and on my opening slide, um, you can see a logo which was adopted by the UK Microelectronics Design Research Community for one of its grand challenges um, for the future of microelectronics design, which was given this title, Building Brains. Um, it's also about as far as my skills at graphic art go. Um, so if you're expecting a flash high graphics value lecture, um, you might be disappointed. Um, the structure of the lecture is uh, outlined here. Um, I come from Manchester. I was born and brought up there. Um, and I've been back there for 20 years at the university. And if you want to look at the history of computer technology, you can learn quite a lot just by looking at what has come out of the university where I now work. So I want to give you a Manchester perspective of the entire history of computing. Um, this doesn't take too long because the entire history of computing isn't that long. And then I want to rewind and give you a personal perspective, um, which to some extent is repeating what you've just heard in the introduction, uh, but I'll add a little detail to that. And then I want to reflect on what we've seen in 60 years of computer technology. And, and I want to try and get you to think a little bit about how rapid that progress has been and what that rate of progress means for um, today's society. Then I want to think a little bit about the future. Um, more or less, uh, some of you will recognize as a play on words of sorts, um, Moore's Law is the thing that drives the industry that, that I'm in. Um, but there are signs that the future can't simply be an extrapolation of the past. Things are getting tough in microelectronics, and that's going to have impact right across computing. We're seeing some major changes in computer technology, uh, the most important of which is the introduction uh, a few years ago of, of multi-core processors, um, and I want to say, uh, reflect a little bit on that. Before I get round to, if you like, my title topic of building brains um, and the current research interests. So that's the plan. Um, let's get going. There's quite a lot to get through. So, a managed perspective. Um, in Manchester, this is where we think it all began. Um, in June 1948, the Manchester Small Scale Experimental Machine, which became uh, nicknamed the Baby, uh, ran the world's first computer program to be stored in electronic memory. So it was, it was the first electronic stored program computer, and therefore, in some sense, um, the forerunner of what we know as a computer today. It was built out of the technology of the time. It came very shortly after the Second World War, and the people who built it had learned their trade um, during the war, uh, principally in the development of radar and the electronics required for radar systems. And they realized that if digital computing was going to take off, um, what was required was some kind of reasonable size, reliable electronic memory. You needed to be able to store bits to build computers. And if you like, the, the core of the Manchester baby was the cathode ray tube you see in the middle of this picture, um, with a very earnest Tom Kilburn and Freddie Williams um, staring at something around it. And the cathode ray tube store was really the key invention of the Manchester baby. In fact, the whole computer was really just a test rig for that digital store. Um, they decided that to test um, an electronic memory at high speed, uh, you needed to have some electronics around it to drive it at high speed. And the simplest thing they could think of was a, a very simple programmable computer, even though it hadn't been invented then. Well, the idea had been invented, of course. The idea had been around, if you like, since Turing in the 1930s and, um, and in the States after that. But the, the key component that was used to build this computer um, was the what we in Britain call a valve, um, what the Americans call rather more descriptively a vacuum tube. And it's a little bubble of glass um, 
from which all the gases have been sucked, um, and a small cloud of electrons is established by a little heater at the bottom. Um, I gave this, uh, some of this talk a couple of weeks ago to um, a young audience in Manchester, and I realized, looking at them, that there wasn't a person in the room who'd ever met a valve. Um, I don't think I have quite the same scale of problem with this audience. But, um, but anyway, this is, this is the way electronics was, folks. Um, and a cloud of electrons is formed from a, from a heater, and then a voltage is applied and the electrons flow, and then another piece of metal regulates the flow of the electrons to give you a switch. And all you need to build computers is switches, uh, lots and lots of them. And the valve is a perfectly good switch, so that's how computers were built in the early days. That's the 1940s. If we step forward a decade, um, there were a number of machines came out of Manchester in the 1950s um, that the Franti Mark I, based on the Manchester Mark I, was the world's first commercial programmable computer. And the major difference from the baby is that because vacuum tubes, valves run at several hundred volts, um, Franti decided to make this commercial product. They had to put metal screens in front of them so that people couldn't poke their fingers into dangerous voltage levels. The technology is still the same. It's vacuum tubes in metal boxes now so that you can't see them and you can't electrocute yourself. In the 1960s, um, there was another extremely notable Manchester machine, which was the Atlas computer. And uh, Atlas introduced many key concepts to the world that are still widely used today. Um, the most notable new idea in Atlas was what we now call virtual memory. Um, in the 1960s, in the Manchester paper, referred, referred to it as single-level store. But it's basically the virtual memory technique that, um, in case you aren't that familiar with computer technology, it's the, th it's the thing that enables your PC to keep running more and more programs, um, and it doesn't suddenly stop when you've loaded so many programs that no more will fit. It just kind of gracefully degrades, or not gracefully in some cases. Um, but that's because behind your back, bits of program are being swapped in and out of main memory, between main memory and disk, to keep things going, and only the stuff you really need to use is occupying valuable main memory. That was introduced on Atlas, um, invented at Manchester. Manchester held the patents um, in the best traditions of British technology at the time. They were sold to the Americans for next to nothing. Um, and IBM made a lot of money with them. But for this talk, the, the key point here is the technology has changed. So um, the little box on the left shows what Atlas was made from. And uh, these are no longer vacuum tubes. They're now transistors. And transistors um, actually are very similar to vacuum tubes. It's just that the cloud of electrons now exists in a peculiar semiconductor material. Um, but the flow is still regulated in a very similar way to vacuum tubes. And so they're just small electronic switches. They're smaller than vacuum tubes, so you can get more in a given space and make a more powerful computer. Moving forward another decade, you'll, you'll notice that in the 1950s and 60s, the world was monochrome. In the 1970s, a little bit of color is creeping in. Um, and the notable Manchester machine of the 1970s was MU5, um, which was a bit of a beast, actually. Um, it, it sat in a large machine room. It consumed about 125 kilowatts of electricity. Um, and it was made of yet another stage in technology. And, and again, if you look at the little picture at the side here, what you'll see is something that you recognize as a microchip. Um, it's a little black piece of plastic with legs on. Uh, you can't see the works in this picture, um, but the microchip um, was a means of printing transistors. So it's still transistors, but now you can print, in the case of MU5, 10 or 20 transistors on a single flat piece of silicon in a single operation. So you get more switches in a smaller space, and you can build more powerful machines. In the 1980s, Manchester produced a data flow machine. This was the university's first um, parallel machine. So there are lots of things happening at the same time here. Um, the data flow idea never really caught on 
across computing, although it's been quite influential inside the design of high-end processors since. Now what you see is a technology which is still a microchip. It looks quite similar to the previous one, but the number of transistors that are printed on this chip has increased from 10 or 20 to now hundreds or thousands of transistors on a single chip. And so the density keeps going up. In the 1990s, um, which is when I started at Manchester, right at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, the computer engineering was focused on uh, a series of microprocessors that we called amulet processors. Um, the key point here is that we're no longer designing computers with chips, we're designing computers on chips. So the tools of the designer um, are no longer the microchips that can be soldered together on big circuit boards. They're now components of silicon design, where a VLSI designer's view is similar to the small color box on this slide. Um, that's something at the level of one or two logic gates um, seen as a piece of chip design. And the overall picture, which is a device which is um, about seven millimeters square, um, is just a vast array of these printed transistors performing particular logic functions. So we've gone from designing with chips to designing chips. And in the last decade, this has moved forward, um, and I'm going to tell you more about this project uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, but the key point here now is that we're no longer designing processes with components. We're now using processes as components in a bigger design, and we can print many complete processor systems on a single chip um, in one manufacturing process. So the technology has moved forward. Each decade it's been um, qualitatively different from the previous decade. And that's moved us a long way forward. And I'm going to look at some quantitative measures of that shortly. But before that, um, my history uh, didn't start in Manchester. Um, for one thing, I'm not quite that old. Um, the Manchester baby ran before I was born. Not much, but a little bit. So um, my personal history um, starts somewhere else. Um, this has been mentioned. When I first moved to Manchester in 1990, everybody in the undergraduate lecture theatre had seen a BBC Micro and had played with one. Um, I'm now teaching undergraduates who've never seen one, which is a very strange feeling. Um, but the BBC Micro um, was the first machine um, of any note that I was involved in. And... That's, if you like, the marketing view of the BBC Micro. Um, this is my view. Um, if you open the box, what you see inside is the circuit board. Um, I was interested in the hardware. Uh, that thing in the middle is the microprocessor. If you like, that's the computer that makes it work. Um, but on the BBC Micro, we did a couple of slightly adventurous things, which was to design a couple of chips specifically for that product. So the second and third rings there are two little bespoke chips that were very simple, but they kind of set the pattern um, for the rest of my career because basically I've been designing uh, more complicated microchips ever since. From the BBC Micro, um, Acorn went on to think about what kind of product it should build to build on the success of the BBC Micro, and um, the development became known as the ARM. ARM, in those days, stood for Acorn Risk Machine um, and has stood for other things in its time and now stands for nothing at all. Um, it's just ARM. And uh, the ARM chip was developed for products like the BBC Micro, for Acorn's desktop products. But in 1990, the ARM activity was pushed out into a separate company. Uh, this was catalyzed by Apple showing an interest in the arm for the Apple Newton. Who remembers the Apple Newton? Uh, there are some people with good memories. It was a, an interesting part of the story because the Newton was absolutely crucial to Apple's, to arm's success. Um, even though the Newton itself ultimately did not succeed, um, it created the business that arm built out from. It opened a lot of doors. Having Apple interested in your product is... A very good tactic if you're thinking of starting a company, by the way. It's my 
It's my one piece of advice. If you want to start a high-tech company, get the Apple badge in there somewhere. Um, the only downside is they'll probably stitch you up in a legal contract that stops you ever talking about it. Um, but ARM arrived in the marketplace just as people were beginning to talk about systems on chip. And, and the reason they were just beginning to talk about them then is the silicon technology had just got to the point where there were enough transistors on a chip that you could put not only a complete processor, but also a complete processor and many other supporting components. So you could build much of a system, usually the whole system, um, apart from some memory devices. And ARM turned out, kind of accidentally, to be perfectly suited to this emerging system-on-chip market. Um, it was small and simple. Um, the smallness and the simplicity were a consequence of having a very small design team that built it at Acorn. The small size left more room for other components in system-on-chip. And this gave ARM a real market advantage when they set out. So in here, the processor is now uh, the small thing in the top left corner of the chip and the rest of the components um, are complementary functions. And as we've heard, ARM went on to be a very major success. Um, at, the, at the beginning of 2008, ARM announced that they passed their 10 billionth shipment, um, which means there are significantly more ARM processors than people on the planet. Um, there are probably more ARM processors than people in this room. Um, my iPhone has six in, I believe. Um, if you, most people in the room probably have a mobile phone, and their mobile phone probably has one or more ARM processors in. Now, that 10 billion is a very big number. They're currently shipping at 10 million a day, um, and so it's growing very rapidly. So it's a very big number of processors. Each of those processors consumes something in the region of 100,000 transistors if you ignore the memory components that always distort the numbers here. And so if you take all the arms ever shipped, which is a very big number, and multiply them by this number of transistors, which is a fairly big number, you get this number 10 to the 15. Now, by a coincidence almost worthy of Douglas Adams, um, 10 to the 15 is actually the number of synapses, the number of vital connections in just one human brain. Okay. So you take this very big number of processors, multiply it by a fairly big number of transistors, and that's how many components you have inside your head um, doing whatever it is you're doing at the moment. We'll come back to that. But let's just try and get a feel for, for what this technology progress means over the 60-year life of the computer. You've seen this, the Manchester baby machine. Now if you look at the processor that's inside your mobile phone, it's probably something like an ARM9. This is now getting a bit long in the tooth. But, um, and also, if you're experienced in chip design, you can look at this and you can see this is being designed by a human, whereas most of today's phone processors are designed by computers and therefore look totally uninteresting, which is why I choose this picture. Um, because I'm from the old brigade who thinks pictures of VLSI are pretty. So this gets lots of marks for artistic merit. Um, if we take the baby and the ARM9 as representative of very early computers and reasonably state-of-the-art, then we see that in the sort of 50 or so years between those two machines, things have changed a lot. But how much have they changed? Well, baby filled a medium-sized room. It was about seven feet tall. And I guess, well, it was about the width of one of these screens. Okay, so a fairly large chunk of metal. It used three and a half kilowatts when it was running, and it would execute in the region of 700 instructions a second. The ARM9 um, fills a square millimeter of silicon less on, on the latest uh, process technologies. It uses about 20 milliwatts of electrical power, and it executes about 200 million instructions a second. Now, if we just look at the power and throughput of those two, we, get a, um, we can combine them to give ourselves a figure for the fuel efficiency of computing. This is miles per gallon in computer terms. And the baby used about seven joules per instruction, 
And the ARM9 uses something with so many zeros after the decimal point. I'm not going to read them out. If you take a ratio of those two numbers, what you see is that the technology has improved by a factor in the region of 50,000 million over those 60 years. Now, this is a very big number. Um, how big a number is it? One parallel um, I learned fairly recently is that the UK road fleet, all the cars, buses, lorries, etc., on the UK roads, use about 50 billion litres of fuel a year. So if the automotive industry had improved its fuel efficiency by the same ratio, one litre of fuel would keep the entire UK moving for a year. Okay, now I know there are good engineering reasons why it's a bit harder to improve the fuel efficiency of cars by that level, but it gives you a feel. It's a huge number. It's a very important number. Because even if we only achieved 50 million, say, so knock three zeros off, if we'd improved energy efficiency by a factor of 50 million, that would be pretty impressive. But you wouldn't have mobile phones and you wouldn't have iPods and you wouldn't have digital cameras. None of these products would make any sense if they used a thousand times the power that they do. The batteries just wouldn't last long enough. Um, so, so it's really, it's this number, along with one or two others that will, will come up later, um, that enable today's modern digital consumer economy. And, uh, oh yes, there's another Manchester link in this slide, of course. Um, James Prescott Jewell, born in Salford. I think I'm far enough away from Manchester to say that Salford and Manchester are the same place. Um, <laughs> very dangerous thing to say at home, but... Uh, and, and, and like all Mancunians, of course, he has an entire ecosystem in his beard. It's uh, very impressive. Um, just to sort of, again, try and give you a feel for how far computers have progressed, let's take a couple of other technologies that have made spectacular progress. Um, I visited the York Railway Museum, and they have Stevenson's rocket, a very early railway engine, and they have a 1930s streamliner, which is about the pinnacle of steam transport, and in fact trains haven't got much faster since. And over 100 years, trains went from 24 miles an hour to 124 miles an hour. Impressive. People were very impressed. It's a fact of five. Okay? Aircraft, they're, they're technically more challenging than trains, perhaps. Um, if you go to the RAE Museum at Farnborough, they have a replica of the Cody Flyer, the first aeroplane to fly in the UK. In 1908, it flew at about 30 miles an hour. And if you like the pinnacle of, of air performance, the English Electric Lightning, um, which in 1954 would fly at 1,500 miles an hour. Well, that's a fact of 50 improvement. Very impressive, but it's only 50. And you take a computer and you just look at raw performance, because that's what I've been measuring in the previous two cases. And we, you can see we've gone from 700 instructions a second to 200 million instructions a second. And in fact, that's of course, as you know, is not as fast as your desktop. So we have something like a million-fold improvement in performance in the computer technology, um, just raw performance. It completely outstrips um, any other technology that humanity has developed, with the possible exception of communications, which is closely related and has seen similar rates of growth. So it's pretty dramatic. And we've got very used to this progress. Is it going to carry on forever? Well, you can guess the answer. So again, the history here, transistors are about contemporary with the Manchester baby machine. They first appeared in 1947, but you can probably see why you didn't want to make a computer with them in 1947. Um, building a few thousand of those would probably produce something that would never work. Integrated circuits were the technology that allowed the printing of multiple transistors, and again, that started looking quite primitive, um, but progressed extremely rapidly. The first microprocessor was... Um, an important milestone in the development of computer technology. And that's 1971. I was at university in 1971, so this, this has all happened not only in my lifetime, but actually in my adult lifetime, well, semi-adult in 1971. Um, this is the technology 
that, that has followed on from that, integrated circuit technology. Now, what you're seeing here is a close-up picture of um, a small component of a microchip. You can see structures. Mainly what you're seeing are metal layers. So the shiny strips are bits of metal. In this picture, you can see three metal layers. And if you look down towards the bottom center left, you can actually see transistors there right down on the silicon surface. You can see the transistor gates in these pictures. There are three levels of metal here. To make a functioning integrated circuit, everything you see in this picture has to work. And furthermore, if you look at one of today's integrated circuits and you blew it up to this size, these are fairly large screens, then the integrated circuit would be about 10 square miles at um, this density. And within 10 years, because we're still shrinking, if you blew an integrated circuit up to this scale in 10 years' time, it would be about 100 square miles. At this level of detail, and essentially everything you see on there has to work. Um, there's very little room to make mistakes in this. The, the wires that go vertically from one metal layer to the next, if one of those fails, the chip is probably a write-off. Um, it's very, very high precision engineering. To get a feel for the wiring complexity of a complete integrated circuit today, designing an integrated circuit from scratch is roughly equivalent to designing the road network of the planet, including public footpaths from scratch. Only on a chip, you have to guarantee there's never a traffic jam. Okay. So it's, it's a big deal, and, and uh, there's an awful lot of computing technology goes into making it possible at all. If you look at the sort of abstract structures um, that we think about, you can see a three-dimensional structure there, uh, again, of a very small area of the chip. These components that you're looking at um, in manufacture are now drawn with dimensions which are about a third of the wavelength of the light that's used to draw them. Um, it's a very interesting technology that's used to produce these things. Ten years ago, it was considered to be impossible. Um, and what's making all this happen has been branded under this name of Moore's Law, which, if there are any physicists in the audience, it's not a law, all right, it's just called a law. Um, Gordon Moore observed in 1965 that the number of transistors on a chip was doubling um, every 18 months to two years. The time scale has fluctuated a bit. Um, and he confidently predicted in 1965 that this doubling would continue for 10 years. So Moore's law ended in 1975, which has barely got onto this, uh, this graph. Um, just to be careful, the vertical axis of the graph is, is logarithmic, so every time you cross a horizontal line, it's a factor 10 increase in components. Now, if you look at this graph, you say, well, those points look suspiciously close to a straight line. And if this was an A-level physics experiment, um, you'd probably get it sent back because you'd obviously cheated. Uh, real experiments never give you points that lie on a straight line like this. But of course, what started as an observation uh, by Gordon Moore in 1965, by the mid-70s, had become the major planning tool of an entire industry. And so the reason these points sit on a straight line is because industry invests to make it so. If you sit in the boardroom of a major semiconductor company and you say, where do we need to be 10 years from now? You draw this graph, it's fairly easy. You stick the point on, you say, that's where we need to be. Now how much is it going to cost? And uh, the answer to the how much is it going to cost question is now getting frightening. Um, the cost of a factory to build an integrated circuit is now in the region of four or five billion dollars um, before you've started. So Moore's law is driving the industry, has driven the industry um, since the 1970s. But just getting more transistors, which is all Gordon Moore talked about, um, wouldn't be that useful were it not for the fact that the way those numbers have been pushed up has also made them cheaper. In fact, as you shrink um, transistors on a chip, they get faster, more energy efficient, and cheaper, all at the same time. Um, so it's a win-win scenario. And the only thing that limits how fast this has gone has been how long it takes to pay off the investment in one lot of plants before you can start investing in the next lot. So it's been a financially controlled uh, regulatory cycle. 
But back in the 1950s, transistors cost about $500 each. Um, again, it's, an, it's a logarithmic vertical axis, and now every time you cross a horizontal line, it's a factor 1,000 reduction in cost. So you see spectacular reductions in cost. And here's my favorite example of what this gives you. It allows you to buy a tiny little card the size of a fingernail um, to give your mobile phone a bit of memory. In fact, enough memory probably to store, well, certainly to store my entire CD collection on. Um, people have debated whether that's an impressive statement about technology or a sad statement about my CD collection. Um, <laughs> But in, in this semiconductor memory, um, there's very little cheating. The only cheating they can do is they can store two bits on one transistor. Okay? But otherwise, every bit on there requires half a transistor. So it's 12 gigabytes. That's 96 gigabits. Give or take 100,000 million bits, so 50,000 million transistors. At 1950s prices... Um, this would cost more than the GDP of most countries, uh, and you wouldn't have one in your mobile phone. Um, but today, in fact, my slide is already out of date. Um, I think I saw a 16 gigabyte one advertised for about 30 pounds um, in the last few days. The price is continuing to go down. But you can buy 50 billion transistors. And even though I know this technology quite well, I simply can't see how they get 50 billion transistors in one of those. I know they're small, but... There's, uh, there's something I don't understand going on in that process. And they're so small that they're now disposable. You can, you, you, you can buy billions of transistors and throw them away and not worry about it. So is this going to go on forever? Well, you guess the answer. The answer is no, because we can't keep shrinking indefinitely. As we make transistors smaller and smaller, then what we see is that what in the olden days was a sort of continuous solid state problem of designing transistors is becoming increasingly close to atomic scale. You get about five silicon atoms to the nanometer and we're currently building chips at 40 nanometer so that's 200 atoms across and the industry is going to 35, 30, 22, 18 over the next 10 years. And in fact the control of the electron cloud in a transistor depends critically on the statistics of the components and as you have fewer components their statistics become less robust and so um, this whole thing is becoming very difficult and what we're seeing is, is a technology that's becoming less predictable and less reliable. So now if you, if you buy a chip you expect it to last many years and keep working the same. On the technologies of 10 years time chips will probably have a, a useful life of less than a year. Um, and to achieve that, they'll have to cope with very big changes in their operating characteristics as they're used. Hopefully that will be hidden from the user. So, um, what else is changing? Well, the other big change, what I talked about at that point was the low-level atoms and devices. The other big change is that the industry has gone through a major transition about five years ago when what had driven computers for decades, making single computers, single processors go faster and faster, finally hit a brick wall. And so uniprocessors running a single program faster and faster ran out of steam. The major manufacturers threw in the towel and said, we can't do this anymore. What we're going to do, because Moore's Law still gives us more transistors, is we're going to sell you more processors. So now you can get Intel Core 2 duos or things with four cores on or eight. And it's going to be 16, 32, 64. You know, we like powers of two in computers. Um, and these can be designed relatively easily. It's cut and paste to make two copies of something on the same chip. Well, it's not quite as easy as cut and paste, but it's that kind of thing. Um, and this is all well and good, uh, were it not for the fact that it runs straight into the holy grail of computer science, which is understanding how to achieve general purpose parallelism in the first place. So we're now buying these multi-core machines, but we don't really know how to program them, except for a, a number of minor cases. It's an interesting marketing trick if you can get away with it. Uh, now, it's not too much of a problem. My laptop has two cores on. Um, when I bought it, I had this optimistic view that, you know, 
one core would probably be fully occupied with Microsoft's stuff. But the other, the other core would actually spend some of its time doing what I wanted. Um, but, you know, I, I sh perhaps shouldn't be so naive. Um, but you can, you can make good use of small numbers. But as the numbers of cores go up, as they inevitably will, we just run into territory where we have no idea what to do. So that's where this talk gets into research. Let's imagine we've gone through this process. We're out there somewhere in the future. And we're in a position where we have so many processors that we've stopped worrying about how many there are. We have a limitless supply of processors. How then do we try and understand how to manage that resource to do useful computations? Uh, one thing I argue is that at that point, what has really held, has been the major thrust of parallel programming for the last 50 years, which is load balancing, making all the processes work at maximum efficiency, simply becomes irrelevant because we have more processes than we ever know how to use anyway. Uh, we can't possibly uh, expect to load balance them. Um, and I argue that evidence is increasingly mounting that what matters is not quite so much um, how fast you can get stuff through a machine, but how much energy the machine consumes in doing the stuff it has to do. Um, so the energy used to perform a computation becomes much more important than whether you've got computation using all the processors fully. Processors are free. It, the cost of designing an ARM processor into a machine is, is, all, is only a few cents now and, and going down very rapidly. So this model isn't, isn't too far-fetched. And when you have very large numbers of processors, the thing that holds you back is having to synchronize computations, so I suggest you should avoid synchronization. And the slight downside of that is that there's a kind of another holy grail of computer science, which is that computation should be deterministic, by which I mean if you do the same computation twice, you should expect to get the same answer. I suspect that has to go out of the window too. Okay? So I'm proposing a world where um, when you do a computation, you get a useful answer, but it's not necessarily the same as the one you get the next time. Um, and, and, and the goal of the research I want to describe is, is really saying how might you make such systems work? Where might they lead? And because we don't know how to do that in the world of computing, I turn for inspiration to biology, where, as I'll say, we see examples of how these problems can be solved quite effectively. And, and I'm asking two fundamental questions. As our computing resources are becoming extremely powerful and massively parallel, can we use those to address this fundamental question of science, how do our brains work? And if we can understand how our brains work, our brains have lots of nice characteristics, can we use those to build better computers? Now, you might think that I'm getting dangerously outside my subject area here, and, and you're probably right. Um, but I have a career as a computer engineer. Why do I suddenly think that looking at brains is a nice thing to do? Well, they address quite a lot of the issues that we've talked about. Uh, they, they are massively parallel. They're more parallel than any machines we can conceive. Uh, it may be 10 to the 11 neurons. Um, it's a big number. Massive connectivity is 10 to the 15 number. Things that interest me as a computer engineer, uh, the biology seems to be much more power efficient than anything we know how to build in electronics. Um, that's interesting. And the brain is made of low-performance components. Now, this is an anathema to a computer engineer. If we want to build a, a, an interesting machine, we find the fastest components we know how to make. We build them into the fastest, smallest engine we can. And when all else fails, we go parallel. Okay, that's, that's the sort of history of computing, really. Um, but nature seems to adopt a different approach. It uses low-performance components. Nothing in your head is operating in time scales much less than a millisecond, um, whereas our computers, we worry about gate delays in picoseconds, many orders of magnitude faster. The communication inside your head is quite modest in speed. It's a few meters a second, whereas my chip design colleagues are forever complaining about speed of light limitations on how fast they can get signals around a chip. just doesn't seem to be a problem for biology. And I've talked about a, a world of, of chip making where things become less reliable. Well, as you sit there listening to me, 
You're losing about one neuron a second. If we have a good dinner tonight, the rate of neuron loss may get significantly higher. Um, but um, the, uh, the point is that the biology is designed to work with failing components at a certain level. Um, one a second isn't too frightening. It's only one or two percent over the useful adult life of your brain. Um, if you start losing 20 or 30 percent of your neurons, then you, then you will have a bit of a problem. But at one a second, you're okay. Um, and, of course, brains have this ability to learn things at a much higher level than, than programming a computer. So there are lots of interesting things to look at. When you look in a bit more detail, um, reading neuroscience papers and textbooks is very hard work. They're full of com complicated chemical words, but um, some essential lessons that, that, that come out are that, firstly, neurons are very flexible as components. There are animals that make good use of 300 neurons. Insects, bees have just under a million. Humans have 10 to the something, 11 or 12. Um, the components are basically the same right across the scale. And uh, so like logic gates, you can build simple logic circuits with a handful of gates. You can build reasonable computers with a few million. You can build supercomputers with hundreds or thousands of millions. Um, the component scales across a range of different functions without changing fundamentally. And when you look at the structure, then you find that there are sort of things that look a bit like circuit diagrams coming out of neuroscience. So the picture on the top right is a, a neuroscientist's view of the six-layer microarchitecture of the cortex. It looks a bit like a circuit schematic. Actually, it turns out this is rather misleading. Um, when you look at the detail, the details of the connections are not uh, documented. Um, to the level that would allow you to re reproduce the thing, to rebuild it. But the statistics are fairly well known. And again, there's an interesting universality about this microarchitecture. So the, the cortex at the back of your head that performs low-level vision, edge detection, and stuff we kind of understand, that microarchitecture looks exactly the same as the cortex at the front of the head, which performs functions we haven't a clue about, such as natural language and thinking and so on. Yet those processes are running on the same microarchitecture. And therefore, there must be some kind of functional analogy that we just don't understand at the moment. Of course, at the low level, um, the neural systems in your head um, aren't fully programmed in your DNA. You don't have enough bits of information in your DNA to program 10 to the 15 connections. Um, they are developed following statistical guidelines so I imagine there are instructions in the DNA which say something like, you bunch of neurons over here, project over there, and connect to about 10% of what you find, um, very roughly speaking. Um, but of course, so, so what you start off with is, is to some extent random, but, but then nature has this um, neat trick of, of adjusting and rewiring until things work better. Um, something that we really have no idea how to do on microchippery. So there are lots of interesting things to understand there. Um, I'm a computer engineer, so my approach to this is to try and build a nice big machine for modeling some of this stuff and, and designing the machine on the principles observed in the brain in neuroscience. So we're trying to build a machine that can run in real time, supporting the levels of connectivity that we see inside the brain. Now, it's a very big machine numerically. It will... It will have something like a million processors in it in its largest scale. And that is only capable of modeling about 1% of the human brain. And that's doing it with quite a lot of, well, extreme simplification um, of some of the neural processes. So again, you should have a lot of respect for the thing inside your head. Um, even though computers are approaching the point where we can start talking sensibly about building computer models, um, it will require a ferocious machine to faithfully model everything that's happening inside your head. And when we've done this, it'll probably use about a million times more electricity or more energy than you do, um, which is something to think about if you want to build humanoid robots with wonderful electronic brains, is they'll need small power stations to, to keep them running. But we're a long way off knowing how to do that. Um, I designed microchips, so, so these are the chips that are going into the system. The one on the left here is real, it exists. Um, and uh, uh, actually works correctly. 
the one on the right is what you can do with, in 20 minutes with paint, taking the one on the left and doing cut and paste. But, <coughs> but actually, designing the chip isn't that different. It's, um, you know, everything we need is on the left-hand chip. We just need more of it. Uh, and, and chip design is a bit like cut and paste. Um, we, we've had first chips. Um, we've built small systems. The, the board on the right has four of these chips in, and it works. Here, here's a wonderful, meaningless demonstration. Um, but it was, it was kind of one, one of our collaborators' dreams that we should have an intelligent donut hunter. Um, and so this Pac-Man-like thing has the inbuilt ability to find donuts and eat them. Um, it has a primitive vision system, so the sort of little columns you can see at the top left, if you've very, got very good eyesight, um, show what the donut hunter is seeing. This is all done with a very simple um, pre-programmed neural network, and it tells you nothing new or interesting about neuroscience. It's, it, it's rather trivial, um, except it was, because what it tells us is our chips are working. And, and uh, this thing, although what I'm showing you here is a video, it was taken from... Um, something running in real time on, on the chips on the right-hand side. So the system is coming together, and this year we'll be moving to some much larger systems. Where, where might this lead? Well, because we're trying to build a real-time brain model, we can use it for applications such as robotics, and it seems to me there are some very interesting um, robot projects running. Um, Murray Shanahan has one of these ICA robots here in Imperial somewhere, I think. Um, and these robots coming out of this European project are quite nice humanoid frames um, where the project is delivering the mechanics but, but no control system. Um, and we're very interested in, in using our sort of real-time simple brain models as, as robot controllers to give them some kind of embodiment um, in which they can develop. Right, um, time is running out, so I'd better draw some conclusions. Um, what I hope you take away from this lecture is that the first 60 years of computing have seen improvements in the performance of computers that are truly spectacular. I mean, they're way beyond anything that we can really understand. But to think the future is simply going to be more of the same um, is perhaps deceiving yourselves. Things are changing. We see changes at the architecture level with the transition to multi-core. We see changes at the component level with approach to uh, atomic scales introducing all sorts of very unpleasant, very difficult to deal with problems, probably extremely expensive to deal with problems, ultimately. Um, we don't know how to use these sorts of technologies that are now coming our way, almost inevitably. Um, but we need to really think laterally about this problem of uh, building parallel software and perhaps changing the way we think about the kind of results we want to get. Um, and we need to learn again how to build reliable systems on unreliable technology. Now, that's not a new topic. If you type that into Google, you'll find papers by John von Neumann in the 1950s. Because, of course, the vacuum tubes, the valves that were used then, were unreliable. And so computer designers in the 50s worried a lot about this. But then... Transistors came along and integrated circuits, and reliability simply vanished as a concern for computer designers for several decades. Um, but it's coming back. And if we don't have the answers, um, I assert that it would appear that biology does, if only we had some idea how it solves the problems. So thank you very much. <coughs>